going to be talking about the French Revolution and the Haitian Revolution, and that's what we conclude with uh, today. Two revolutions that take place around the, around the same time, one of which uh, is considered a world historical event, uh, maybe the French Revolution, the other one which has been really marginalized, but which in some respects, uh, at least from the political standpoint from which I speak, uh, is I think at least as important, if not more important than the French Revolution, at least in some respects. But, but again, that's a determination for you to make. Uh, it's just that I think it's very important that we have some uh, understanding of what was happening uh, elsewhere in the world. Uh, and in particular, when we turn to Haiti, we'll see that we are speaking about uh, a place that was under the French sphere of influence, if I may use that uh, particular phrase. So uh, uh, once again, the back, backdrop here is that we're looking at revolutions. Uh, we'll continue with this when we look at the Industrial Revolution uh, uh, next week as well, uh, on Monday. Uh, and uh, the larger context, of course, is that you know this is the age of, some people would say, the age of revolution. You had, uh, obviously, the, uh, uh, the American Revolution, uh, the Declaration of Independence, and then eventually the formation of what was going to become the United States late 18th century, uh, and then of course the events in, in France. But uh, I want to, uh, as I suggested to you before, I think that you should keep some distance from this conventional view, because uh, as I pointed out to you uh, when I gave the illustration uh, from uh, uh, early 20th century uh, India, the first half of 20th century India, that that uh, what, uh, what uh, uh, Mohandas Gandhi or Mahatma Gandhi as he's better known, uh, tried to achieve is not usually described as a revolution. In fact, it's almost never described as a revolution, but we might want to think about why it is that uh, something as momentous as that is not described you know, in that particular language. And a revolution is, as I've said to you, uh, an overturning right, of the established order, uh, the overturning of the established order. So if you look here, uh, the French Revolution is also, of course, considered important because it is associate, associated uh, with what you might uh, describe as the birth of the modern, okay? <coughs> uh, the birth of the modern. Uh, let me just pause for a second to talk about that because that's a constant theme uh, in this course. Um, what do we mean when we say modern? What does it mean? birth of the modern. Or what does the modern period mean? Yeah. Basically post-enlightenment. Post-enlightenment. Right. But that's chronological, right? That's chronological. Give me a definition that doesn't involve chronology. What 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 would it be? It is but seems like it's part of our group that are still Okay, uh, it's associated with ideas such as the uh, nation state and the birth of the liberal, right? Okay, uh, what else? Any, anybody, anybody have any? Yes? I mean, in other words, the regime of logos, logos means reason, the regime of logic has a very old history. Right? Now, I think what you're trying to suggest is that, that although you didn't use that word, uh, permit me to use it, it's the rise of reason and the decline of something else. What is that something else? Faith, possibly, right? The decline of faith. So the, the modern may be not just the rise of reason, because we've seen the rise of reason before too, right? I mean, if you look at what is called the, in the theory of the axial ages, that you know that in China, in India, in Greece, simultaneously, several hundred years before the birth of Christ, you had a great renaissance of intellectual thinking, right? And in many respects, you would say that that was the Buddha himself thought through things. 
So there was a there was reason there too. But what what is perhaps distinct? Well, I'm just putting a question mark. What is perhaps distinct at this point is that beginning in the second half of the 18th century, the rise of reason is also accompanied by the decline of faith. Right? That might be that might make the proposition I think more acceptable because then we really begin to try to understand what makes the modern world more modern. Let me suggest a couple of other things just for you to think about. The notion of individual subjectivity. The notion of individual subjectivity. What is the subject? Right? Who is the subject? Who is the thinking being? The notion that you get individuated, that is that an individual is is an entity, a person who is deserving of dignity, respect, and all of that. And the individual as a subject, as a thinking person whose conscience may in fact be one of the determining influences of history. Right? Or let's use a different language. When did the distinction between the public and the private start to become important in history. And you could say, late 18th century, the distinction between the, between the public and the private, that when people said, you know, there are some domains that are strictly private. And this is, by the way, when, when many philosophers and thinkers in the second half of the 18th century began to argue that religion was actually a private affair. That you had, so not everyone in the late 18th century associated with the Enlightenment is anti-religion necessarily. But what many of those who were, who were people of religious belief, nonetheless the significant departure that they may have effected at that point was to take the view that religion was going to be a private affair. It would not be a public affair. Right? And we have not used that word which we need to use now, and this is what will now take me back to the French Revolution, and that is secularism. When did the idea of secularism arise? And what does secularism mean? Right? It means, among other things, all right, that's not the main definition of it, but this whole, if you want to link it up to the distinction I've made between the public and the private, and the notion that religion is, in fact, something that belongs in the private sphere, right? That, for example, we, we do not, in principle, I think in the U.S. is, again, I think a bit of an exception among Western democracies, because religion, I think, plays a much greater role here than it does in some other Western democracies. But in principle, the person who is standing for the office of the president, his or her religious belief should not be a factor. That's what secularism means in, in part. I, th I think here it is actually a factor, unfortunately. But because I think, for example, if a Muslim were to stand as president, I think the chances of getting elected are one in a million. You know, okay? I mean, it's unthinkable at the moment. Unthinkable. Because, because unfortunately, religion does in fact <coughs> actually play a role, which according to secularism, it should not play in the public domain. That a person's religious beliefs are strictly a private matter. And so, it, so many of the many of the late 18th century thinkers began to take that view. Uh, there is a kind of a conventional textbook definition that is very often given of secularism, and that is a separation of what is called the separation of church and state. And in principle, the U.S. Constitution is beholden to that. In principle, the U.S. Constitution is beholden to that separation too, right? Okay. So that's what is called the establishment clause. In case you don't know, of the U.S. U.S. Constitution. All right. Uh, Bill of Rights, all right? So now, keep this in mind, because what we are interested in, principally, although we will begin with a brief chronology of what was happening uh, in the French Revolution, uh, and why is it, it, you know, that events took that particular turn that they did. Yes, there's a... Do you have a microphone on? There's like a lot of feedback. No, I don't have a microphone. Maybe the recording here is doing something. I don't know. No. Yeah. No, I don't have a microphone. Yeah. Okay. Uh, is 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 that a factor everywhere for everyone? Yeah. Yep. Uh, yeah. I, I, so I, I don't know. No, I don't have a microphone. No. Um, okay. So uh, let let me also let me let me just. Okay. 
I don't know if that's it. Yeah. All right. So what I want to what I want to now do is very briefly do the following. Okay. So if you look at the phase phases and chronology of the French Revolution. Okay. If you look at this over here, this particular slide over here. September, this one, this, oh, this is actually the previous slide. I have to go back to the previous slide. So it begins in May 1789, okay? And you have what is called the Estates General, the nobles, clergy, and commons, okay? So the Estates General are summoned by Louis XVI. They're summoned by Louis XVI, <coughs> who is, of course, the king at that point in time. Uh, and what is it that prompts him to actually call the Estates General to call to summon a meeting. Uh, the last time, by the way, any such meeting had been summoned was over 150 years ago. Over 150 years ago. Okay, so this is something that was really uh, quite unusual. And there is a kind of a rigid social structure that you find in France at this point in time. Uh, when when we talk about the Estates General and the three groups of people that constituted the Estates General, keep in mind that the nobles constitute 2%, the clergy constitute 1%, and the remaining 97% is the common people, <coughs> okay? So the nobles and the clergy constitute together 3% and are in fact actually exceedingly influential, all right? So that, that's, that's a social structure that I'm really talking about over here, okay? But what is it that made Louis XVI summon the estates General, so there had been a, there had been obviously a great many sources of unrest at this point in time, leading to the French Revolution in 1789. Uh, one of them had to do with with the with what you might call luxury spending by the monarchy. Okay, luxury spending by the monarchy by Louis XVI and his family members. Uh, secondly, of course, uh, France, as is true of many of the European countries, had long been involved in war. So you had a, a substantial war debt. Uh, and remember, by the way, that the French had been involved in the American War of Independence. I mean, for those of you who remember your US history, you will remember that there was French involvement as well. And in fact, to a certain extent, we could say it was French involvement that enabled actually the American colonists to break away from Britain. So you had a substantial amount of debt arising from that. Um, you had a general, a general questioning, which had been precipitated by early Enlightenment philosophers. So Voltaire is, is before this, of course. And what was that general question? The questioning of this whole idea of the, of the divine right of kings. Right? Because if you have to look at the nature of French monarchy, you would have to say fundamentally that this is some kind of absolutism here. Right? That is the political system that you have. Absolutism and despotism, by the way, don't mean exactly the same thing, but there's a kind of an overlap between the two. And what you have is what is called absolutist rule uh, in, 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 in France at this um, point in time. Um, and food riots were, in fact, actually quite common uh, in France at this particular juncture. In the 1770s, 1780s, you have a substantial number of food riots, and you actually have very substantial shortages of food as well. Now, it is, it is in this context that Louis, Louis XVI decided that he would summon the Estates General for a convention in order to be able to try to see if he could alleviate the situation, which was now, in, in a sense, getting out of control, all right? Uh, and so this is, this is what happens in May 1789. Uh, so there's going to be what is called a general assembly or sometimes a constituent assembly. I just want to add a little bit footnote about the phrase constituent assembly because uh, uh, this phrase is used even down to the present day. Whenever a country achieves independence and they decide that they're going to draft a constitution, they will have a constituent assembly. So a constituent assembly is a body that is assembled by a nation, usually a newly emerging nation or a newly independent nation in order to be able to put together a constitution. So this is what happened, by the way, in India in late 1946, shortly before independence started, they had a constituent assembly. And this is what happened to take one of the more, one of the more, more, more recent examples. This is what happened in South Africa. 
1993, they actually put together what was called a constituent assembly and then drafted a constitution for the first free republic of South Africa, because as you know, that's when apartheid, apartheid was demolished and Nelson Mandela that eventually became in the first free elections that they had in South Africa, the president of South Africa. All right, so this is, this is what happens. Now, the 1789, July 14th, you have the fall of the Bastille. Uh, these are events that you can track down, you know, as I said, in any number of his uh, textbooks and articles. Um, what is the real significance here? The real significance here is the revolt of the masses. And here, again, we want to stop for a second because I want to alert you to this notion of the masses. What do we mean? Who are the masses? And we, of course, in some general sense, we understand who the masses are. The masses is all of us. Right? But when do the masses emerge as a force in history? I think that this is where the French Revolution is, in fact, important. Because it would be difficult to say that in all the preceding centuries of English democracy, and England had been a democracy not in the modern sense necessarily, and of course England, as some of you may be aware, never had and does not have down to the present day a written constitution. There's no written constitution in the United Kingdom, all right? But England had, of course, had what you might call a functioning democracy with parliament, for example, convening regularly, and of course a tussle going on between parliament and the, and the monarch for several centuries before the French Revolution. But in all of these centuries of English democracy, the masses never emerged as a force in history. <laughs> So this is where we, where we would say that now it is not the king who exercises sole sovereignty and who is the only subject. This is the subjectivity of the masses. And if you want to use a very different kind of language, this is obviously what, it, what popular will means, that the popular will now becomes predominant in a certain sense. One of, the, one of the things we'll try to do briefly later on in just about five, 10 minutes is to try to dis make some distinctions between what happened in the American colonies when the Declaration of Independence was issued and then eventually leading to the formation of uh, uh, another country, uh, what the United States of America, right? Uh, what, what distinguishes what happened in that revolution from what happened in the French Revolution? Because someone might well argue, well, is it the case is it not the case that the notion of the masses was important in the American Revolution too? And my submission to you would be that no, it wasn't. It wasn't important in the same way as it was in the case of the French Revolution, all right? Now, in the city of Paris, they set up what is called the Paris Commune. There is a much later Paris Commune that Marx writes about, but that is, of course, the revolutions of the 1870s, okay, that we're talking about. This is, this is 1789. Uh, and what does the Paris Commune mean? It, it basically means that the city of Paris itself established its own government, la run largely by what you might call what people who were the subject people before. So this is what is going to be known as the Paris Commune. So it establishes a, 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 a alternative source of authority. Remember that at this point in time, the king is still around. And you have, I want to take you to a different slide just for a moment so that you begin to understand what are some of the different uh, parties to the conflict that we're talking about. So if you look at this, what are the parties to the revolution? So you have the masses, you have the royalists. Who are the royalists? These are people who are the defenders of monarchy, right? Defenders of monarchy. Then you have the moderate liberals who believe in some notion of limited monarchy. Their leader is a man called Mirabu. And Mira Bu is, is in fact actually going to die, in, I think, around 1791, uh, um, uh, around that time. Then you have the moderate Republicans, known as the Girondists, um, and the extreme Republicans, known as the Jacobins. Okay? The, uh, and, and, and this is where it's, uh, you will now understand the title of this particular book. There's a very famous uh, West Indian writer, C. L. R. James. He passed away some years ago. Uh, he wrote a book called The Black Jacobins. 
And what is he referring to? He's referring to the radical Republicans in Haiti, right? Who basically used the ideas of the Jacobins. So the Jacobins were those who were, in fact, actually extreme Republicans, all right? Uh, and then you have the sans culottes, the men, literally the men without the breeches. These were mainly merchants, artisans, and clerks rather than peasants or working class people. And then you have the emigres, those who, who in French intellectual figures who had gone into exile and were weighing in on what was happening in France from overseas, okay? Uh, comparatively smaller influence than any of the other parties to the conflict, right? So when we talk about the Paris Commune, now let's go back again to that slide. When we talk about the Paris Commune, what we are really saying here is, that uh, this was an alternative source of authority that was established that was anti-monarchic, so forth and so on. And then in 1789, uh, what is going to be issued is what is going to be called the Declaration of the Rights of Man. Right? Uh, you notice that I highlighted rights of man. Why have I done so? Because I want to alert you to two very different things. Yes. No, they didn't include Sorry? They didn't include women's rights. Yeah, it didn't include women. So that's the first most obvious. What might be the other what might be the other major thing here? Um, they had different meanings for man at the time. Like there were different levels of humanity. Can you spell it out a bit? Well, obviously with Western philosophy, they considered the black man not as people deal with Okay. Right. So, so, uh, so uh, I agree with you entirely, but I would say that your answer complements the other example, which is to say that we can problematize man in all kinds of ways, because what man, of course, meant white man, right? So that's what you're saying. That look, you know, there's an issue of what if you're black. That this is not, this is not a universal declaration. Uh, and, and, and this is, by the way, without even any reference to the fact that all such declarations that were issued, uh, and if you look at the history of the United States at that point in time, you know, who is it who was entitled to vote? It wasn't simply white men, by the way. It was white men who were property, who were property. So we can keep on qualifying that. And, and so, but is there something else that comes to mind in the phrase rights of man. What about the word rights? Think about the fact that every movement, <coughs> social <coughs> justice movement today, every identity-based political movement on this campus is predicated on the notion of rights. What might be a possible problem? Rights have corresponding duties. They have corresponding duties. One of the things that has made us modern, and it may not be the best thing, <coughs> is that we have gravitated so much towards the conception of rights that we have forgotten that it has always been linked with corresponding duties. And of course, I know there are people, you know, there are women and there are African Americans, and they'll say, you know, we don't want to hear about duties. We have heard about it because we were oppressed, the duty of women, for example. Right? I understand that. No, you have, one has to be able to anticipate the, the argument that is going to come by way of an objection. But it is also, at the same time, worthwhile, worthwhile thinking about the fact that some kind of notion of rights which started percolating down at this point in time, and now if you look at it 250 years later, that this, there is a kind of what you might call a rights discourse, which has now become the common form of political discourse. Right? And the problem, of course, is that rights are very often gained at the expense of someone else. If you speak about the rights of man, I want to suggest to you another problem. It became a license for the unchecked exploitation of natural resources. Now, I don't think the people who were creating the Declaration of the Rights of Man were thinking of that. But this notion that human beings exercise dominion over the natural world, over the animal world, right, 
is something that is a consequence of this period of thinking. That's what I'm suggesting to you. One of the most interesting things that's happened in the last 10, 15 days, I'm going to write about it and I'll send you a little you know, note when I've written about it on my blog, is in New Zealand and in India, independently in these two countries in the last 10 days, courts have ruled in both countries that rivers have rights. Rivers have rights. Now, where do we stop? With that. Of course, the reason why they're saying that is because they understand that the problem that we are living in now is this idea that human beings have the dominion over the whole natural <coughs> world. There is a biblical injunction for that. And this is what has brought us to our present state of crisis if you think about it, which is why the court in New Zealand is saying, you know, a river has a right. If a river gets contaminated and polluted, the river should be able to file a lawsuit. And so and now the river has a human being who's representing it. Okay, and, the, and three days later in India, the high court of Allahabad reached exactly the same decision with respect to two rivers in India, the Ganga and the Yamuna, that these rivers have rights, right? But, so we are saying, we're not just looking at, we're looking both at man and rights. And, the, and, and, and what I'm saying to you is that very often what people will do is they say, ah, we understand what the problem is. The problem is just this notion of man, because it meant white man, property, white man, etc., etc. Yes, that is a problem, no question about it but there's also a problem with the notion of rights. In, in the sense in which I am articulating it, of course you have to go back to that period of time to understand how revolutionary it was, because at that point, the notion of the rights of man contested the notion that kings have a divine right to rule. Right? All right. And so, it, so uh, 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 if, you know, if you follow the trajectory, so what you have, and then 1791, uh, 1789 to 1791 is, as I said, the General Assembly or the Constituent Assembly, uh, and 1791 it's going to become what is called the Legislative Assembly. It goes through the French Revolution, goes through, you know, there's a terminology in the National Convention, Legislative Assembly, uh, uh, and, and some of the details you will find in, in, in as I said, in ordinary textbooks and so on. So forth and so on. Uh, but it's basically the beginning of lower class unrest, beginnings of foreign wars as well, because there's going to be because there are going to be foreign powers which are going to start to weigh in on what's happening in France. 1792, the first use of the guillotine. Okay, I'm going to return to that later on uh, because we want to look very briefly at the semiology. Okay, the semiology, semiotics. Uh, what kind of uh, how, uh, what kind of sign is the guillotine? Okay, why does it become such a symbol of dread? And you know, of course, a verb is used as well. He or she was guillotined. Uh, Louis the Sixteenth was guillotined. So was Marie Antoinette. Uh, in fact, most of the leaders of the French Revolution were in turn guillotined, uh, including Robespierre, uh, to whom we'll turn in just a couple of minutes. Then 1792, September 20th, there's a civil constitution that is promulgated. This is the founding document of the ideology of secularism, of secularism, which I have now already discussed with you to some extent. Um, and, I, and, and, and this is exceedingly important because I think in France, if there is something that they are attached to, especially those who view themselves as beholden to the French Republic's ideas of liberty, equality, fraternity, right? You know, the, that, that attachment in particular is to the notion of secularism, a kind of a civic religion. Now, I want to talk about this for a few minutes because, again, it has implications, and I may have talked about this very briefly in my last lecture, I don't remember, it has implications for how we think about the word today. You know that 
in France as in the United States. Let's take two countries, okay? In both these countries, there has been a considerable element of public opinion which has been hostile to the use of veiling by Muslim women. And so, and in fact, actually, in a number of European countries, they have attempted to pass legislation, in some cases successfully, okay, which would, which would make it difficult, if not impossible, for, for Muslim women to engage in veiling. And I don't want to get into, by the way, the whole semantics of veiling. There are different kinds of veiling, okay? Uh, the hijab, uh, the full hijab, you know, the headscarf, uh, all of these, you can make these kinds of distinctions. I, I, I don't want to get into that. That's a very long subject. But what I do want to say, and this is, I think, what is the most important thing, and this is a matter of my interpretation, which you can leave it or take it as you like, namely that the opposition in the United States and the opposition in France does not stem from the same source. The opposition comes from very for different, for, comes for very different reasons. In France, the opposition comes largely from an attachment to the notion of secularism, a strict interpretation of secularism. Right? Which is not to say that some of those who are opposing this may not actually have anti-Muslim sentiments. They may. Right? But it's not coming largely from that. In the United States, it is coming from the hostility of Christians to Islam. It is not coming from the whole background of secularism. Right? We have to understand that the sources of this opposition in these two countries are quite different. And so therefore, we, what I'm saying is that this is one of the reasons why one studies something like the French Revolution. It's not simply a relic of history in that sense. That certain of the norms that have shaped uh, not just French society, but as we're going to find out, society elsewhere as well, has certainly been shaped as a consequence of the French Revolution of 1789, which of course continues for several years, right? So then in this, so then in the next, uh, this is a, a continuous narrative, I've just put it in two slides, from 1792 to 1795, you have what is called the National Convention, which is now the radical phase uh, of the revolution, okay? And just a little footnote, by the way, we often speak about, by the way, right and left, you know, are you a leftist, you know, are you right? These terms, right and left, come from the French Revolution. Because in the, in the assembly, where you sat, if you sat on the right as opposed to sitting on the left, right, that determined your political disposition. That determined your political disposition. All right? So the origins of right and left in modern politics go back, in fact, precisely to <coughs> this point in time, to this juncture. Now, 1793, Louis XVI is in fact actually going to be guillotined, all right? Uh, and, and the leader of the Jacobins, who at this point had been Robespierre, and one of the things that was assigned to you was uh, one of the speeches by Robespierre, because Robespierre was the person who was in charge of the Committee of Public Safety. By the way, whenever a committee has got a name like that, you can almost always reckon it is a instrument of tyranny, almost always. All right, uh, you find that even today. You know, you find countries in Africa that are dictatorships, uh, and they call themselves, they give themselves the fanciest political names. You know, the sovereign, socialist, democratic republic, or such and such thing. Uh, and then the next thing you know, they're committing a genocide against some minority group. Right. So, uh, uh, which is, by the way, not not something that only Africans. I mean, I think by now you should know my politics enough to know that I don't think Africa is the biggest problem in the world uh, by any stretch of the imagination, you know, okay? But I'm saying that whenever you hear this phrase, you know, uh, committee for public safety, uh, you should, you should uh, dread it, which is exactly what I think people in, in France and particularly in Paris were beginning to find out uh, because it really became an instrument of terror. Uh, this is, and this is, of course, exactly where these phrases, which have now become stock, uh, 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 you know, uh, stock phrases, 
uh, in the English language, such as a revolution devouring its own children and so on. This is, they come out of this particular kind of origin, right? Because if we were trying to understand, and that would be a very long project, we would of course have to understand, well, why did the revolution take this particular turn? And, and one of the reasons it took this particular turn is because, of course, the, the radical elements within that could, in some sense, broke no dissent. You know, the, the capacity to be able to tolerate dissent is a very difficult thing, very difficult thing. Right? And, and I think the French Revolution shows us the limitations there, that even those who have a problem with the existing order in turn themselves become incapable of being able to actually receive dissenting views. And this is what really <coughs> happened over here. All right, uh, and we're not going to go through the rest of it because, as because uh, you know, it, it goes through some a, a few other phases. Uh, but essentially, of course, with the ascendancy of Napoleon in 1799 as the first Council of France, and he's going to become the emperor, the French Revolution is pretty much dead at that point in time. All right. Now, a uh, couple of considerations. I wanted to show you a few slides very quickly. So this is the uh, this is the, uh, the Bastille. Um, uh, many of these are, are uh, contemporary, uh, con uh, contemporary uh, drawings and sketches, uh, paintings in some cases. Uh, this is the storming of the Bastille. Uh, there is a very common notion that one of the reasons the Bastille was stormed is because it was holding hundreds of political prisoners. Uh, there were actually seven prisoners in the Bastille when it was stormed. But it was, it was uh, a, uh, a, a place that occupied a substantial place in the imagi political imagination of the rebels, okay? Uh, and in this pair, you see uh, Louis the Sixteenth and Mario Antoinette, who had fled the capital. They are captured uh, close to the border, and then they are brought back uh, to Paris. Um, uh, this basically gives you, you know, uh, a, a brief sort of explanation of what are some of the causes of the French Revolution. Uh, all of these slides, not the photographs, all of them will be made available as I've indicated, uh, both in lecture and in the email that I sent out to you yesterday. Uh, you know, so for example, growing burden of feudal dues, absolute monarchy, right? Uh, the influence of America was important. I mean, if you're thinking about the causes of the French Revolution, because it was clearly people who were inspired by what had happened in the American, in the American colonies. And if you were going to do the history of ideas, you would certainly have to look at something, something like that. All right? Um, now, um, uh, very briefly, uh, some of the things that interest me the most, uh, this is the guillotine. This is Louis the Sixteenth being guillotined, and uh, here you have uh, uh, another uh, uh, print of that time. You can see it right over here, the guillotine over here, all right? Uh, and just show you a couple more, and then we're going to pause to talk about this for, for just a second. And this is Marie Antoinette. Uh, under the guillotine uh, in 1793, about 10 months after her husband, uh, who had been guillotined back in January. Uh, and this is the execution here now uh, of um, Robespierre, uh, you know, the, the leader of the Jacobins. Uh, uh, and um, this is what is called the 18th Brumaire of Bonaparte. Uh, what is Brumaire, by the way? It's also the name of a the name of a book, famous book, going to be written by Marx. Brumaire is the second month of the Republican calendar. One of the things that the French revolutionaries did was they created a new calendar, right? And that's quite important because about the only time that a new calendar is created is when anybody when a new religion is founded, the Muslim calendar, for example. So this was a kind of a new civic religion that was being created. And there was this, of course, a sense that, that this is a, a world-creating event, and so we need to actually now, this is the beginning of history in a different way. We need to have a new calendar. So they actually created a calendar. It was very short-lived, all right? It was very short-lived. But Brumaire is the second month of this Republican calendar, running from October 22nd to November 20th, right? Uh, and, and this is when Napoleon was brought to power and then became the Council of France. And as I mentioned to you, effectively, this ended 
the French Revolution. <coughs> All right, what are some social cultural aspects of the French Revolution? The guillotine. Now, you've seen several slides, right? What, say you had to write an essay on the symbolic significance of the guillotine, right? Because there, why, why the guillotine? Why the guillotine? Why not, why not just take Louis XVI, you've captured him, take him to a jail, and pop a bullet into his head, right? So you have to think, number one, the masses. Number two, spectacle. Spectacle. Right? You see, you know, from the point of view of the victim, you might say, well, it doesn't matter. You know, if I'm going to be shot dead, if I'm going to be popped in the head, if I'm going to be given a, a, a cyanide pill, or if I'm going to be guillotined, I'm dead as a dodo if I'm dead. From the point of view of the victim, but no. But death is a social act. It's a social act. Right? And so one of the things, of course, that the guillotine did was it basically brought this idea of guilt to the public stage. You know, in the, in the Soviet Union, they always had these um, under, uh, under uh, Stalin, for example. You, know, you always had these public show trials, public show trials. You wanted to make a show of a trial. Now, this is a different kind of spectacle because this is a way of trying to, of course, also establish a new order. It's also suggesting that this should become a public fact. It is, of course, a warning to others. And of course, there's something very dramatic. <coughs> it is something very dramatic. In fact, the person whom after whom it is named. This is one of the supreme ironies that you often find in history. The person after whom the guillotine is named is a man who was actually opposed to, okay, it's public use in this fashion. Okay. So his name is, I think, Joseph Ignacy Guillotine, something like that, That's his, he's a doctor. He came up with the guillotine, he invented it because he wanted, uh, method of death that would be relatively painless for the victim or for the criminal, if a criminal was being. Because death was a rather sordid affair. You know, when people were killed, when criminals were sentenced to capital punishment, I mean, it could be a slow, torturous death. Right? And, and so for, from, from his point of view, this was a humane way. It was a humane way of saying that, you know, look, you might be a serial killer, but you are, you are entitled to a humane death, right? Which is, which is why in the US Constitution as well, not that it's always observed, there is a prohibition against cruel and unusual methods of punishment, right? There is. And, and this, is, this is what the, the founder of the guillotine really meant it to be used as a kind of way of delivering a humane punishment. He didn't realize, of course, that the cultural semiotics of this guillotine would take it to a different level where now it would become an instrument of mass killing because it was going to be used extremely widely. It was not going to be reserved simply just for, in other words, it was a way of dispatching people to, the, to their death rapidly. Right? And so to be guillotined also meant very often that you never really actually received any kind of hearing. You know, you were simply sentenced and then you were taken straight to the, to the public stage and you were guillotined, okay? So that's, that's the first set of issues. Uh, and when I highlight these, I'm not suggesting to you, by the way, that these are the only issues. I'm just highlighting some social cultural aspects to give you a different kind of reading of the French Revolution. So the second is the immense growth, immense growth of print media. In the 1790s alone, 2,000 newspapers were founded. It's an explosion of print media, and this is the beginnings of something that had been seen in the American Revolution as well, the pamphlet war, the pamphlet war. The Jacobins, the Girondists, the masses, each of these groups was, in fact, using the public domain. Right? So it's the explosion of the print media. It's the growth of what you might call the public domain. 
you know, the notion that you have a kind of a coffee house where you go to now, all of these in some ways, you know, where you consort with fellow students and friends, this is the beginning of what you call public spheres. And this is what was really happening here in France in the 1790s, uh, okay? That's what I'm trying to suggest is one of the one of the most important things in the French Revolution. Then, of course, you have the national anthem, which is going to become the La Marseille, you know, composed in 1792, which is going to become, in fact, uh, you know, the, the theme song, of course, uh, but it is going to have a certain kind of resonance in French culture there, thereafter, right? Uh, we can also speak very briefly about the role of women. One of the documents that you have uh, been assigned was uh, a document which had to do with the uh, Declaration of the Rights of Women. Uh, because, of course, when you have the expansion of the public sphere, even if the men are not enlightened, which is, I think, something that can be said, uh, certainly at that point in time, and perhaps at this point in time as well, but what is certainly true is that even when when men are not enlightened, when you have the expansion of the public sphere, it means that women are also going to be able to enter into this sphere. Uh, in fact, there was also an attempt uh, by the Jacobins to shut women out of politics uh, in 1793, which is an interesting illustration of the fact that the most radical elements in the revolution were, in these matters, socially very conservative. Right? They still thought that women should be confined to the domestic sphere, right? Um, so these are some of the social cultural aspects of the um, revolution that I would like you to think about. Uh, this is a caricature of uh, uh, the, the Kibbutin, uh, but we don't really have time to look at it in detail. Let me just take a couple of minutes, a couple of minutes, which is all that really remains to set up things for about the Haitian revolution. Now, um, around the same time, Right? Overlapping. If we turn our attention to the greater Antilles, so you have Puerto Rico, you have Haiti, this is Hispaniola. That's what this is, this, this island. The, the western half of it was called Haiti, the eastern half was the Dominican, what is now called the Dominican Republic, used to be Santo Domingo, right? And then you have Jamaica and you have Cuba. All right? So these were. What kind of colonies were these? What, what would have been the major major cash crop? Sugar. Major cash crop, sugar. And I want to, you also have, by the way, coffee, okay, which has a long history by this point in time because the use of coffee was becoming quite common in Europe already by this, by this point in time. And Originally Spanish colonies, but, but Spain by the 17th century had turned its attention to more lucrative colonies in the Americas, such as Mexico and Peru, all right? And so therefore, which is something we can't really cover here because we'd have to then go back to the much earlier period, that by the 18th century, when the period that we're looking at now, <coughs> for some period of time, this had already become Hispaniola, had the latter half very strong influence have already become a French possession and have been a French possession for a long period of time. If you look at this particular slide here, so you see here it says uh, the Spanish or Eastern part, right? The Spanish or Eastern part, and here it says the French part. So the Western half, what is now called Haiti, and what became the first Free Republic of Haiti had become French. All right, so this is, this is where we are at the moment. Um, uh, uh, the Haitian Revolution is going to commence in 1791, so you can see, the, you can see obviously the overlap with the French Revolution. Um, and I'm going to continue with this. We're a little bit behind schedule, about roughly about half an hour, but we'll catch up. 